be with you this morning. And as we uh, continue our series of lessons on taking the steps of faith, we've been trying to ascertain what it means that regarding the steps of faith. As a congregation, our goal or our mission is to make disciples of Christ. And we're also to grow disciples of Christ. So it's not just making disciples, but growing disciples. And one of the ways in which uh, we can grow as disciples of Christ is in our giving. That we learn to give generously. And uh, we often joke about giving. And as long as we don't have that song, Jesus paid it all, uh, prior to the giving, uh, people will give. But, uh, but the funny thing about that song and that line is that Jesus paid it all, all to him, I owe. Uh, and so therefore that kind of erases the fact that we don't have to give because Jesus paid it all. But we are talking about that this morning, about giving. And, uh, and we'll get more involved in that as we go. But as growing disciples of Christ, growing Christians, and all of us are there. You've heard me say over and over again that we are all students of God's Word. No one graduates, but we're all students until we die. And so we continue to grow. We continue to learn more of His will for us in our lives. But one of the ways uh, that we've discussed already was that the fact that we need to worship regularly in order to grow as Christians. And so... We need to worship regular. We need to connect with God through Bible study and prayer. We also need to live differently. We need to be different from the world. Paul says in quoting the Old Testament, Come out from among them and be ye separate, thus says the Lord. Not to be like the world. We're to be different. We're to be uh, so different that people see Jesus Christ living in each of us. And, uh, and so that's a, a very important aspect of Christian growing, Christian growth, and also to do life together. And do life together simply means what we're doing here. We assemble together. And not only for worship, but we assemble for different things. Uh, like this afternoon, we'll be assembling for a meal and for a devotion. Sometimes we'll assemble for other things throughout the week. Uh, so uh, th that is an important life uh, portion a life element of this congregation and of course of the Lord's church itself that we do life together and of course today that we need to give generously give generously and I was thinking about you know one of the first things that we begin to say in our life well the first thing that we say when we're born is mama right mama then maybe daddy maybe right uh, but the next thing that we say is is mine mine and so we begin to look at what other people have and we say mine and uh, if something is there on the ground by itself it's it's mine if there's something there that is appeasing to my uh, pleasing to my sight it's mine if there's something that's actually broken in disrepair, that's yours, right? <laughs> but we see how that begins early in life. Mine, mine, mine. We're like Velcro. Everything comes to us, sticks to us, and it becomes mine. But as Christians, we're supposed to be more like Teflon. Everything that comes our way is to bounce off us and to go back the other direction. And so that's the whole point and part of giving generously. And so we can no longer be clutchers and grabbers of things, but we are to open up our hands and let things go. No more hoarders, but givers. Givers. We're supposed to be blessed by our Lord so that we can bless others. That's the whole point of the money that we have in our lives. The things that we have. All things are meant to be shared with others. And that's the point that Jesus makes over and over again throughout the Bible. He says, 
Don't let money be your God. And so we find here, when Jesus leads, generosity follows. Where Jesus leads, generosity follows. And I suppose that's the biggest obstacle in our lives. And that is, discipleship's biggest obstacle is stewardship. The Bible over and over again tells us that we need to be good stewards of the things that God has given us. And not to be uh, spendthrifts, not to be, or not to be uh, spenders who will spend everything that they have. So again, we are to be good stewards of what He has given us. And so whenever we talk about money and about giving, and by the way, I've been here almost a year. It'll be a couple weeks I'll be here a year. And this is the first lesson I'm giving on giving. And so don't think that there's an ulterior motive behind this sermon. There's not. The point is, is that we need to give no matter when and where. And that's a commandment for all of us. And that we give of our time, that we give of ourselves, and that we give of our means, our our money. And when I say our money, I mean His money. Our money is His money. What He has given us belongs to Him. It comes from Him. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. It's from Him. And so we are just saying, thank you, God, whenever we give back and whenever we give some to other people. We're saying, thank you, God, for giving your Son to me. And so giving ought not to be a problem for us, but sometimes it is. So Jesus, he spoke about money more than any other subject. Do you know that? You talk about the kingdom. You can talk about love. You can talk about grace. And of all the subjects that one could think about, Jesus spoke more about money. And I believe there's a reason for that. One out of eight verses in the Gospels is about money. And there's a reason. Because that's the battleground that the devil was going to use with you and me. Which person or which thing are we going to subject ourselves to? The authority of Christ or the authority of something else? And typically... What it comes down to is the authority of money. Money runs our lives. And of course, money's important. Money does run our lives in some ways. We have to pay for things. We have to get through life with money. It was the same with Jesus' day and with the, his disciples. They had to pay for food. They had to do things. They had to travel. Look at the, missionaries, uh, uh, the missionary trips of Paul. Paul had to have the money. He took money from what they gave to live off. And so he chastised the church at Corinth because they were a wealthy church. They had all the means that they could give. And he chastised them because they held back. They wouldn't give. But he pointed to the fact that those in Macedonia were, who were very poor gave all that they could. So money would be the chief battleground for the heart's of men, the hearts of you and me. And of course, Jesus said, as we read in the scripture reading, in verse 24 of chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, note, he doesn't say you can't serve God and Satan. He says, You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon is money. And Jesus would never budge from that principle. You can't serve God and money at the same time. And so you remember the story within that very same context. A young rich ruler comes to Jesus and he says, Hey, what can I do to have eternal life? What one good thing can I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, Hey, just keep my commandments. He said, I've done that from my youth. I've done that already. So then Jesus said, well, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Then the young man went away 
sad. Because the authority that he bowed to was the authority of mammon. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. You can't serve God on one hand and mammon money on the other. And so money plays a big role in our lives and it plays a big role in scripture. And so we have to understand the need of giving away that which God gives to us. And that's the point that we have here throughout the New Testament. Of course, have no other gods be before me, the Bible tells us. And yet, if we follow the money, we will find out where your heart is. You just got to follow them. You hear that expression in politics or in business. You just follow the money and the money's going to lead you to the truth. Well, the same thing with you and me. You just follow where we give our money and then we'll know who you serve. That's the point that Jesus is making. So we need to understand that discipleship without stewardship is not discipleship. It's not following Jesus. We have to have stewardship of all things in our life, especially money. You know, we get our money sometimes and we think about, well, I got to pay the bills and I got to do this and I got to do that. And then at the end of it all, we haven't made any preparations or any purpose in our heart to give back to God. Everything else has comes first. And yet, the Bible tells us, Jesus specifically, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. And in this very same context, he says, and all these things, what he's been talking about, all your needs will be fulfilled. So, if you're seeking the kingdom first, then guess what? You're giving to God first. That's the point that Paul makes about giving in 1 Corinthians and also in 2 Corinthians. He says, as you purpose in your heart, giving involves forethought. It involves sitting down and understanding from within with your finances what you're going to give to God. The Jews had to do it. They had to give 10%. They had to give that tithe, the 10%. But they also had to give the first of their fruits. And not only the first of their fruits, but they also had to give the best of their flocks. And then they also had to pay the temple tax. So when you think about all, all that's said and done regarding the, the giving the Jews had to, had to make, somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 to 23 percent. Now, we come to the New Testament. We don't tithe in the New Testament. Ten percent was the monetary sum of the Jew. 10%. That was under the old law. Under the new law, Paul comes along and he says, here, here's how you give. You give with your heart. And then he says, as you purpose in your heart. And you give as God has prospered you. So let's think about that. God prospers you during the week. Out of that sum that you've made, he says, it's from the heart that you purpose, that you decide beforehand, this is what I'm going to give to God. And then he says, God loves a cheerful giver. Not begrudgingly, that you're not holding back, but he says, out of that sum of money, you can give as much as your heart can supply. Within reason now, he's not saying go broke. He's not saying don't feed your family. Of course not. But God does come first. And that's what we need to understand. And so when we uh, put our money, or where we put our money, is a clear indicator of where we put Jesus in our lives. How about you this morning? Does Jesus come first in your life? Jesus desires that we give as much as we can from the heart as we purpose, as he has blessed us. And we have, what a joy to think about, to give back to God. 
God's saying, look what I've done for you. Now all that you need to do is just give from the heart right back to me. And we're doing that to serve Jesus and to serve others. That's all under the umbrella of stewardship. So a giving, therefore, is a sacrifice. Our worship is defined as a sacrifice. Our giving is defined as a sacrifice. And so when you think about our worship, yeah, you know, it's a chore to get out of bed. It was a chore for the Jews too. Just like you and me, it was hard for them to get up and going, especially when you had a family, to get dressed, to go to the temple, to go to the tabernacle, to do those things that God desires of you to do. And yet, he calls that a sacrifice. He says, you know, that's what happens. There's, there's no pain if there's no sacrifice. But when there's a sacrifice, there's pain. Right? So it, it ought to hurt us a little bit. It ought to make us a little uncomfortable when we come in to worship. Because we're not doing what we want to do. We're doing what God wants us to do. Hopefully from our heart that we're doing it. There's other things that we could, could be doing. But he says, I want you to come and worship me. Do that first. Then go fishing. Then go watch NASCAR. Then go watch the NFL. Then do this or do that. But put God first. That's what he's saying. And so we make that commitment as a sacrifice. The same thing with giving. They say give till it hurts. <laughs> that's, that's a sacrifice. It hurts to part with our money. What sacrifice does not have pain? And you think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there was plenty of pain there. So we find, in similarity, the idea of suffering as we give. And so he says, All those who desire to follow me, let him deny himself. I want to do that. I want to use this money for this. Well, but I need to serve my Lord. So I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to serve the Lord and serve Him with my gift offering. I'll just have to wait a week or two for this thing that I want. That's what that means. And so the early disciples, they were sold out for Jesus. They sold out for Jesus. And not only did they uh, live differently, they gave generously. Notice, in Acts chapter 2 it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. As anyone had need. Here you go. I had this gold ring and I sold it. You can have it if you need it. You need that money. That's what this is talking about. And of course I want to bring in the context so that we understand. It was the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls were baptized that day into Jesus Christ. And God added them to his church. And a lot of these people were from other parts of the Mediterranean world. So they're there on their own. And they're going to stay there for a little while. After all, they're new members of this new movement called Christianity. So they're finding out more about it. So they didn't expect to stay that long in Jerusalem. But because of the circumstances, because of their conversion to Christ, they decided to learn more about this movement. And therefore, people had to put them up in their homes. They had to be put up in the inns. People had to be fed. And so they got all this stuff together. And they sold it. And they allowed these people to stay there. It's kind of like sometimes when you have groups come in from other churches or from colleges and you put them up for a week or two and you feed them well that's what happened that's what was going on on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem at that time and then later on in the same book two chapters later in chapter 4 it says and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them 
and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And so again, the same kind of group is there, and they're overstaying their stay. Before they go back home, they need to be fed. A lot of these folks have their kids with them. Kids need to be cared for. Families need to be cared for. And that's what's going on here. So when Jesus leads, generosity must follow. It will follow because Jesus is leading. And so I'm not saying that we all have to take a vow of poverty. That's not it at all. No way. None of us need to take a vow of poverty. But what I am saying is that we need to make a move toward generosity. We need to be more generous with our time, with ourselves. And I keep saying that with ourselves because we're going to be reading a passage where it says the Macedonians gave of their, their money, their means, but first gave of themselves. I suppose therein lies the answer to the problem of giving. If you haven't given yourself to Jesus Christ totally, then I guess your giving won't be given completely. Be held back. But when you give yourself to Christ, you can say what Paul said. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. He's directing me. He's the one that has authority over my heart. And I'm going to follow him and do what he says. So again, where Jesus leads, generosity follows. Also, we need to consider that generosity is a faith step. It's a step of faith. You know, when you consider the fact that God is trustworthy, do we really believe God is trustworthy? Do you really trust in God? Because the Bible tells us that if we give, He'll bless us back. He'll repay our needs. Do you trust that? We need to. I mean, after all, how can you trust a God with your money? Or how can you trust a God with your soul who can also trust your money, right? But if you don't trust Him with your money, how can you trust Him with your soul? So, it's imperative we understand the significance of giving. Because again, we talk about the fact that Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. And then we come into the next thought, which we were talking about. He says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Notice that. Talking about a poor people. We're talking about a poor people. It says, The trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. Interesting passage. Paul's writing to, to the Corinthians. And he's basically shaming them. In this letter he's saying. Listen you held back. You could have given me. The money that I needed. I needed to survive. I needed the money to give to the poor and to the needy and out of that I would take what's owed me is what he's saying but you held back and then he says it was 
by the grace of God that the Macedonian brethren who were poor, deep in poverty, gave beyond their means, gave more than I could ever think of. That's what he's talking about. And then he calls this giving grace. He says, you abound in this grace also. And so when we give, when we give to the Lord, when we give to others, when we help people, that's called grace. And he says, abound. Abound in that grace. Be willing to give. Be willing to give of yourself, of your time, and of your means, your money. Because you can't serve God and money. So the imperative here that there must be a generosity that's founded in trust and in faith. The focus of our giving should be not on what we are giving, but on what we can expect from our giving. That's the point. These people were giving because they saw the future. They said that I want to please God. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2. We seek the glory and honor of God. We do that by doing the things that God wants us to do. Giving is one of those things that God wants us to do. And to give abundantly and generously as we have received abundantly and generously. And therefore he says, you give that way. And then you can expect to be honored by me. That's what he's talking about. That's what those folks were looking for. There's a story of a young man who worked for Dairy Queen. And a man came in, and I guess he ordered his hamburg and his fries or whatever he was eating. And as he was walking toward the, to his table where he was going to sit down and eat, he dropped the $20 bill on the floor. In comes walking a lady, and she sees the $20 bill on the floor, and she picks it up. So the young man working behind the counter says, uh, excuse me, ma'am, that $20 bill, that belongs to the man that came in before you. But she kept insisting that was her $20 bill. Wouldn't give it up. So the young man went out from behind the counter, reached in his wallet, and took out a $20 bill out of his own wallet and gave it to the man. He said, here, you drop this on the floor. Well, someone was there taking note of that. Be careful now. Wherever you go in this lifetime, you're going to have a camera on you. And you're going to have people taking notes. And evidently, someone wrote a little letter or an email to Dairy Queen. And guess who responded to this young man? A guy by the name of Warren Buffett. And honored the young man with a great sum of reward for the good that he did. That's what these people were doing in the first century. They understood that God would reward them. He promised them that. So they gave as much as they could, knowing that they were going to receive in the end. That's the point. That's the blessing. That's the trust. That's the faith that is indeed involved in this. So again, generosity is also a hope step. It's a hope for eternal life. It's a hope. Notice in Luke chapter 16, he says, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous money, mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting home. The whole point is, is that when you do give, they're going to please you. They're going to applaud you. Just think about going to heaven for just a second. You're going to have people in your life, perhaps who've gone to heaven, and they're going to say, you know what? That time that you gave me money helped me more than you ever knew. And I just want to thank you. And then God. God will bring over the angels of heaven and perhaps give you a piece of cake and a serenade. But they're going to honor you in some way. And all of that because of your giving. 
So he says, give. Give until it hurts with love and with hope. That's the idea of giving. So, as he continues, he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, command those who are rich in this present age. Oh, let me stop there. Who's he talking to? Talking to Christians. And then he says to the rich, who's he talking about? How many here have a cell phone? How many here have a TV? How many here have a car? You're rich. You think about the rest of the world. You think about third world countries and they're all over the place. There's people drinking out of mud puddles. Brethren, you're rich. The poorest people in this country would be termed the rich in other countries. And so he says, you who have these things, you rich in the present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly, richly all things, that's present tense, continues giving us richly. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold of eternal life. Giving is associated with good works. Giving is associated with hope. Giving is associated with eternal life. It doesn't help to call yourself a Christian and never give. That's not a disciple. That's a hoarder. That's a, a rebellious child of God. But a loving child of God, a true child of God, one who abides in his word is going to give. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. He calls on us each individually to be able to give and to help others. And then he calls us to give first to him first to him and so God ought never be left out of the picture so we are blessed to be a blessing so we say thank you to God we say thank you to Jesus and we say thank you to the Holy Spirit every time we give money away to help others that's what that means so generosity is a love step and I hope you love others and I hope you love your brethren because that's what giving's all about. It's about love. And if you're not giving, I suppose you're not loving. Loving is giving. And remember, it's a sacrifice and there's going to be a little pain, but that pain is going to go away because love is going to cover that pain and your heart is going to be soothed. I guarantee you that. So, as we consider the idea of trust, there is there your heart will be also. Notice the order there. He says, where your treasure is, your heart follows. He doesn't say where your heart is, your treasure follows. Where your treasure is, what we said before, we can decide, we can find out, we can determine, we can see, we can judge. We have the right to judge one another. Right? We're not to have a hypocritical judgment. But we can determine and see who is a faithful child of God simply by giving. You can know that. And so he says, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Are you giving more money to booze? Are you giving more money to women? Are you giving more money to the car? Are you giving more money to the things down the road? Are you giving more money to the casinos? Are you giving more money to any other thing? Well, then that's where your heart is. And it certainly isn't with Jesus. But if your heart is with Jesus, then you're giving to those in need. Those who need it the most. 
And every time we give something away where we could have helped someone else, they suffer more. And Jesus says, think about that. Remember, how would you like to be in a situation and have someone else do that to you? Oh, I think the casino's more important than helping old Doug. That's sad. Remember, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We need more of the golden rule in this country. We need more kindness. We need more compassion. But it begins with you and me. We're the, we're the ones saying we follow Jesus. And if we're the ones following Jesus, then by golly, we need to show that we're following Jesus with what we give and how we give and have a wonderful demeanor in giving. That's so important for each of us. And did you know, I'm going to close out here, in 2017 there was a study from Harvard University. Very interesting study. They surveyed 4,000 millionaires in the United States and they said that the happiest people who were of the 4,000 were those who gave their money away. Did you know that? Did you know that 2,000 years ago, our Lord said, you know, it's better to give than to receive? Why? It's because it's going to make you happy rather than hoard it up. And so happiness, therefore, is contingent upon your, your faith, your hope, and your love for God and for one another. But it all begins with the idea of giving yourself to Christ. If you haven't done that, you can do that this morning. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized, give yourself over, die to sin, be baptized in a watery grave for the remission of your sins, come up out of the waters a new person, a new creation, a new slave wherein the blood of Christ is activated and wherein the blood of Christ will forgive your sins continuously. That's a wonderful blessing. And he says all spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. Where you are baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. You can do that this morning if you're willing and you desire to give of yourself so that you can give to others. You can do that now as together we stand.